B. Moorhead. I'm the executive director of Texas Impact. For those who don't know us, Texas Impact is Texas's oldest and largest interfaith advocacy network. We were founded in 1973 to bring the Texas faith community's voice to the Capitol to advocate for justice. And can we agree that there is no justice without election justice? And that's why we are saying, let my people vote. We're fortunate to partner with other nonpartisan statewide membership organizations, League of Women Voters, NAACP of Texas, and League of, Latin America, League of United Latin American Citizens, LULAC of Texas. We are so grateful to these organizations for partnering on this event, and we have leaders from all of them speaking. We are also grateful to the dozens of faith communities who are co-sponsoring this event. We're so happy to say that there are way, way too many of them to name. You can find all of them on our website, texasimpact.org, and on our Facebook page at Texas Impact. We are looking forward to their continued partnership after today. And if you are not already in partnership with us, please come join us. You'll be hearing from state and national leaders of our organizations, and as they speak, I know you will see that preserving our democracy is not a task for a few people inside the building behind us. It's a responsibility and a privilege that we all share, and it's a blessing when we can all do it together. I'm gonna to turn it over to our first speaker, Rabbi Neil Blumhoff of Austin, who is representing Texas Impact's Board of Directors today. Good morning. I am honored to represent the Texas Impact Board of Directors and to welcome you to our Let My People Vote rally, a time for us to publicly lift up voting right access and participation for all qualified Texans. We, along with our partners and allies, value each one of us in our participation in the sacred democratic process of choosing our representatives in our government. We are students of history, and we remember the firm line our country took, the United States of America against the strictures and constrictions of Great Britain, our colonizers, when we declared no taxation without representation. No taxation without representation. As patriots, we declared an end to intolerance and enacted a new beginning for a new nation, bringing us to this moment. We too are urging no taxation without representation. All who are qualified to vote should have an unfettered opportunity to do so. This is our inalienable right. This is an idea that is taught in the Bible. In the Holy Scripture, the children of Israel are to each give a half shekel as a way of counting. While this is considered to be a census taken in the camp, it can also be seen as an early practice of voting. Each person in the camp, no matter their background and station, offers the same half shekel. Each offers a vote, a testament to the fitness of the camp itself. And as citizens, it is our job to protect our democracy. By voting, we exercise our basic right to choose our government. By voting, we raise our voice and say that the aspirations and ambitions of the founders of this nation have reached every one of us, that we stand proudly to cast our ballot, and that our lives thus are valued and seen all of us. We today have embedded taxation with representation in the way that we order our political system. To not do so is to make a mockery of the liberties upon which this nation was founded. Empowering all citizens who can vote to choose our representatives is the greatest strength of our democracy and is a stronghold against despotism, juntas, and tyranny. Let us not think otherwise. When access to voting for qualified citizens is disallowed and devalued, we open the doors to enmity and strife. 
It is the ballot box where our disputes should be resolved, not in the streets, which is our last stand. In the Bible, in order to make the camp run, God decreed that each person participate, from the elders to the officials, from the wood choppers to the water drawers. In our time, let all who are able to do so vote freely without coercion, without intimidation, and without ensnarement. We, the people who love our democracy, must continue to work to keep access open honorably and transparently. Y'all, let my people vote for what starts here. For what starts here sustains our nation. For every voice, for every vote, for the legacy and the robust, durable health of enduring freedom. Thank you. I'll make that. Thank you, Rabbi. Next, we have Bishop Mike McKee from the North Texas Conference of the United Methodist Church. Thank you, B. I want to thank all of you for being present this morning uh, with us uh, and uh, of the legislative session and, the, of course, the conversations that will happen after that and for being with us last night. And I'm going to share some of the things that I shared last night because they bear repeating. Um, when I was a senior at the University of Texas, I was privileged with three other students to have a private tour of the library with Lady Bird Johnson. And at the conclusion of that tour, we went upstairs to Lyndon Johnson's office and we had a conversation with him that we thought would be five minutes but was much longer. It really happened because of a question I asked him, Mr. President, what do you consider your greatest achievement as President of the United States? And the answer was uh, very informed and very good. But he said that the critical piece that a lot of people don't understand was the voting rights bill. And I think we all know why, because those of us who are governed, we believe all people who are governed by our government should have a right to choose who will govern us. That is the key to the integrity of an American democracy. Of course, no one is for voter fraud, but the key to integrity is what we are for, not what precisely we're against. And we're for every citizen to develop trust in a government that is borne out by everyone being able to cast a ballot who is qualified to do so. We believe that it should be done so that it's not difficult to get to the polls or that they have another means to vote. And the deal is, is we want people to be able to vote. That is not too much to ask. And when we finally realize that the very integrity and the goodness of our government is dependent on all having a vo voice and being able to exercise it, then we get into a better place as a state and as a country. It's beginning to be the point where we can trust people because we know that somehow they are elected by the citizens of their county, their districts, their state, their country, and they're able to do the right thing. Friends, this is not necessarily a partisan issue. It is simply a choice whether we're going to be a democracy open to all or not. And, in the, and history always takes us to the right place. Sometimes it takes a lot longer than we want to, but the time for now is very important. Let our people vote. Thank you for being here. Next, we're going to hear from Bishop Sue Briner of the Southwestern Texas Synod of the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America, down south. Thank you, B. It's great to be here today. As B mentioned, I serve as the Bishop of the Southwestern Texas Synod, which is one of three Lutheran synods in the state with about 85,000 baptized members. I'm here today because as Lutheran Christians, we believe that government is a gift from God intended for the safety and flourishing of all human beings and in fact of all creation. We believe that God rules over all the creation and part of the way that God rules is through a participatory government. 
This government is called to recognize that all humans are created in the image of God. All humans, friend, friends. And therefore have both the fundamental dignity and fundamental rights. To evaluate how the government is doing in protecting those rights and dignities, our primary lens is the question, is our neighbor being served? We have learned that our neighbors are best served by a government in which earthly power is held publicly by the people, a democracy. And they are governed by representatives chosen in free and fair elections in which each person is assured of their vote, a republic. Such consent requires government to allow the neighbors it serves to pursue their lives in a spirit of freedom. The importance of this can be illustrated by our shameful history in this country in which so many African Americans, Native peoples, Latin pe Latinx peoples, Asian Americans, and women have been denied the right to vote and so have been governed without consent. In 2013, our ELCA churchwide assembly passed a resolution calling on local, state, and federal governments to guarantee the right to vote to all citizens and to discourage or eliminate laws, ordinances, or regulations that would have the effect of racial and ethnic discrimination in the exercise of that right. Today, we are troubled to see how the Texas legislator is responding to the wave of partisanship and paranoia across our country. The election reform bills they are considering here would limit access to the ballot for many voters who are poor or disabled. People of color, seniors, shift workers, and single women all testify that these bills would make it harder and more frightening for them to vote. It is time to press the reset button. Yes. Election security cannot come at the expense of voter access. My faith tradition compels me to protect the vote of every Texan. Our democracy is only healthy when it includes all of us. I encourage my fellow citizens and Christians and faith, people of all faith traditions to speak out with me and for our legislators to abandon their current divisive legislation and start over again, centering the wisdom of local communities and affirming commitment to mutual respect. Thank you all. Next, we'll hear from Virginia K. Solomon, who's the CEO of the League of Women Voters U.S. Good morning, Texas. Why are we here today? Why? Let our people vote. I am Virginia K. Solomon, CEO of the League of Women Voters of the United States, and it is an honor to be here with you today. I am here at the request of our great Texas League President, Grace Shameen, because we know you are on the front lines of some of the worst voter suppression our country has ever seen. Suppression that threatens some of our most closely held values, like fairness and our sacred American right to vote. But Texas, we are at an impasse. And our political parties must come together. They must serve the voters of Texas because we will not go back to the days of Jim Crow. But how do we do this? How do we move forward with transparency and ensure that every Texas voter 
has the opportunity to make their voice heard? How can we pull together voices on the left and the right to stand up for democracy for all? I say it's not too late. I change my mind all the time. It's OK for these legislators in this building. There is no shame in changing your mind. Because America is watching. America is watching Texas because it is not only the ground battle, it is not only ground zero for the battle for our democracy, but because so many of our American ideals are enshrined in this great state. So this is our call to action today to ensure we are advancing voting rights for the people. Texas can become a, a beacon for other states by expanding the right to vote and ending this impasse. That these legislators can stop their partisan bickering, stop making it about the political parties and make it about us, the voters. Because why? They need to let our people vote. We saw great advances in voter turnout in 2020, and we cannot go backwards. We will not go backwards. We must commit right now to stay in this fight for the long haul. And the League of Women Voters is in this fight with you here in Texas, in our nation's capital, and in every state in this country. We will not stop. We want to thank you all. Thank you, Texas Impact, for letting us be here today. And thank you all. We believe in you. We stand with you. And together, we will win this fight for voting rights. Thank you. Next up, we're going to hear from Imam Islam Mossad, a leader with Texas Impact and the Texas Muslim community. All right. All right. Salamu alaikum. Oh, wait, wait, me say, say howdy. <laughs> That's in a and &M. Over here we say hook em. <laughs> Just to give you an education on the Austin uh, landscape here. So hook em horns. Um, I begin first with the name of God, the most gracious and the most merciful. He is indeed a God of love. And this is about love. If you love a person, you want to hear that person. You want to listen to that person. You want to care for that person. By... Having this attempt, which is a semi-veiled, cynical attempt to suppress participation from people of all walks of life, black, brown, white, Muslim, Jew, Christian, Buddhist, Hindu, atheist, from whatever background to stop them is going against what God himself, as is recorded in the Quran, said, said all of you, mankind, have come from one pair of male and female. Yes, a male and a female. Because it is only 101 years ago that women had the right to vote in this country. And August 18th, 2020, when the 19th Amendment was ratified. And so it is really... I don't want to say shameful, but it is really hilarious that 101 years later, we have to stand here to say, give everybody the right to vote. So it is not about letting our people vote as much as it is the people will hold you accountable. Do you want to be on the side of Pharaoh, a despot, a tyrant? Or do you want to be on the side of Moses, a freedom fighter? So all of us here, we stand together knowing that we were created from one male and one female made into nations and tribes so that we would know each other because by knowing each other, we love each other. I conclude with a statement from Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. He said, the best of your leaders and I hope all the leaders are listening, political or otherwise. 
The best of your leaders are the ones that you love and who love you. The ones that you pray for and they pray for you. He said the worst of your leaders are the ones who hate you. When you tell a young person, I'm going to limit access for your voting right, what are you telling them? Are you saying I love you or I hate you? He said the worst of your leaders are those who hate you and you hate them. And they pray against you and you pray against them. So I am calling for the higher Texas, the Texas of the leaders loving the people, the people loving the leaders, the, the people praying for the leaders and the leaders praying for the people. Let my people vote. Let my people vote. Let my people vote. Thank you all. Amen. Next. Taylor First from First, Uni First United Methodist Church in Austin has a few words. Good morning, friends. Are you melting? Is it worth it? Yes, of course it is. We're so glad you're here. I'm Taylor First. I'm the senior pastor of First United Methodist Church. We're the one with the dome right there. I am actually reading a statement from Bishop Joel Martinez, the uh, retired United Methodist bishop and lifelong champion of civil rights. He is sorry he could not be here in person today, but he sends these important words. He says, one of the proudest moments of my life was taking my aging parents to vote in our hometown of Seguin, Texas. As faithful Christians and thankful citizens, they considered it their civic duty to vote. As people of faith, my dear parents would have heartily agreed with Reverend Theodore Hesburgh, longtime president of the University of Notre Dame, who said, voting is a civic duty sacrament. For years, in the face of the unfair and undemocratic poll tax in this state, my parents dared to vote. When the Voting Rights Act nullified that unjust practice, they celebrated by always voting and set an example for our family. Were they alive today, in the face of those who would impose new taxing burdens of fear, intimidation, and threats to their rights as citizens, they would vote without fear. Though they never read the words of Reverend Hesburg nor heard the voice of Congressman John Lewis when he said, the power of faith can be used as a lifeline of spiritual strength to change a nation nor the call from Willie Velasquez of the Southwest Voter Project, who reminded us, your vote is your voice. I am sure their response would be a full-throated amen. Today, I support all the efforts and resistance to unjust and unfair voting restrictions here in our state and everywhere in the nation. I stand with all of you in continuing the legacy of commitment of my parents and their generation and previous generations of women, African Americans, and Mexican Americans who were excluded and pushed out, pushed down, and pushed around through unlawful exclusion from the right to vote. What now, preacher, you may ask? I close by sharing the story of farm worker leader and civil rights champion Dolores Huerta. One day in a small town in the Central Valley of California, she called out to bystanders on the sidewalk to join in a march to the state capitol for farm worker rights. She said, don't be bystanders. Don't be bystanders. Get off the sidewalk and walk with us into justice history. It's time to heed Father Hesburgh, John Lewis, Willie Velasquez, and Dolores Huerta before it is too late. Thank you. Amen. Next up, we're so excited to welcome Cindy Benavidez, the CEO of LULAC. <laughs> Buenos dias, Tejas. Estamos levantados. 
Are we awake, Texas? Are we awake, Texas? My name is Cindy Benavides, and I serve as the CEO of LULAC National. Thank you, LULACers. Where are my LULAC members? Thank you, LULAC Texas, for always being presente. I traveled all the way from Washington, D.C., because I understand the time that we're living in in Texas. We're living in a Texas that is notoriously known for ground zero, for oppressive strategies and tactics. Let us call this for what it is, that us, nosotros, the growing majority of people of community co color should not have political power. The belief in the status quo, whereupon our communities of color live in poverty and shouldn't have access to opportunities or be able to prosper. The belief that Latinos, mis Tejanos, were never even here, though we have been here since before the Guadalupe Hidalgo Treaty. We were at the Alamo. We were here before Texas was Texas. And we will continue to be here as 60 million Latinos strong. And in just three decades, Latinos will be 120 million strong. What does that mean? One in three Americans will be of Latino ancestry. We are your present Texas. And we are your destiny, America. As I think about our call to action and how we create change, let us run for office, for our youth, our young adults present, and anyone who has desire to create change. Let's run to create a change in Texas for inclusiveness. Let's run with a pack of people that stand next to us. Porque Texas necesita cambiar. We need to make sure that politicians understand who has the power. Who has the power? Who has the power? Who has the power? And as Dolores Huerta and Cesar Chavez would say, si se puede, mi gente, si se puede. Let's repeat it one more time. Si se puede. Texas legislators, you can't cover the sun with one finger. No pueden tapar el sol con un dedo. Estamos aquí y estamos poniendo atención. Estamos aquí y estamos presente. Estamos aquí y seguiremos creciendo como semillas que crecen aún durante una tormenta. Y a mi pueblo latino, a mi gente latina, we're growing, we're putting attention, we are awake, we will vote. We will continue to vote. We will run for office until Texas legislators change. We will make sure that Texas changes for the nation. Estamos presente. Gracias. Thank you, Cindy. Now we have a legend in Texas civil rights advocacy, our good friend Gary Bledsoe, the president of the NAACP of Texas. We thank you so much. And I want to thank everyone for being here today. You're here for a very noble purpose. We're trying to make sure that we do not create an apartheid government here in the state of Texas. I'm so enthused to see so many good people of different faiths, different religions, different backgrounds that are here today. Because maybe it is a religious community that can make a difference. Because my friends, let me lay it out to you where we are today. We must go inside this building. We must convince the grandsons and granddaughters of the Confederacy to take their feet and their knees off of the necks of people of African descent and Latinos. My friends, they must be asked this question. The question is, will you stand with Strom Thurmond, Lester Maddox, and George Wallace, or will you stand with good people? 
like Bill Ratliff, like Everett Dirksen, like Lyndon Baines Johnson. My friends, we're here in the spirit of that great American John Lewis who believed that deep inside of you there's something good in everybody. So we must go there with the spirit of love and try to convince them of the errors of their ways. But I want to say here that what we must understand and explain to the legislators, because I'm sure that they will tell you that this bill does not contain any bias, but it does. I don't have enough time to go here and stand and tell you all of the reasons why it is biased. One of the points I want to make, though, is that if you have an issue with some kind of a, some kind of conduct of an election official, why don't you make for additional training or provide some different avenue instead of criminalizing it? Texas is reaching back to its roots. And what we must understand is when Texas decided to have a poll tax, what did the legislature say the reason why they adopted a poll tax? For election integrity. When Texas decided to adopt a law that said that black people could not vote in the Democratic primary in 1923, what did they say? Election integrity. What did they say today? Election integrity. We know what it is. We have to expose it for what it is. And so when we go and talk to them, don't listen to any of the nonsense. We have to reach out and maybe, maybe appeal to the goodness of their hearts. But if we cannot do that, we also, of course, must hope that there is a second emancipation proclamation or something akin to that from Joe Manchin and the Democrats in Washington, D.C. Because unless you issue that kind of declaration, I'm afraid of what's going to happen. So Texas has moved forward. We've made great strides. We've got people in different parties and different races, et cetera, that come up here and work together. They're trying to change that. They're, they're trying to change that in perpetuity so that for generations, for generations, we will have 35 to 40 percent of this population controlling the outcome of the elections. Black people, brown people, persons with disabilities, and women need to share in power like everybody else. But this, w this bill has provisions that are anti-black, that are anti-brown, that are anti-disability, and that are anti-female. And we have to understand that there are specific provisions that do that when the data comes in. So you've got, you're doing the Lord's work today. I look forward to hopefully seeing that we can make some kind of, uh, some kind of uh, uh, steps today that might move the legislature away from where they're going. And uh, one final comment, I, uh, I hope I haven't gone over, but we have to applaud the legislators in Washington, D.C., okay? We have to applaud them, okay? Because they did the only thing they could do, and they're the only thing standing between us and Jim Crow too. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next, we have Rudy Rosales from the LULAC State. How are we doing, Texas? Well, I want to start off by sending a message to Greg Ab Abbott and Dan Patrick. We have a saying down here in Texas. Don't pee on my boots and tell me it's raining. We're tired of the lies. We're tired of misinformation. Stop it. Just stop it. Do you all know that at least 700 of our fellow Texans died because the governor failed to come to take care of our grid? That's what he should be worried about. How many more Texans have to die before Grab Greg Abbott does something to take care of our most vulnerable? Our grid should be our priority, not claims of voter fraud. But I have a, I have a message for Greg Abbott. We will crawl on broken glass, and we will get out the vote. Am I, are you with me, Texas? I leave, you, I leave you with this. I want you to tell everyone you know, your friends, your families, your grandpas, your grandmas, you get them out there, you register them, and you get them out to vote. And in the words, I will end with the words of the famous immortal Bob Marley. 
Get up. Stand up. Stand up for your rights. Get up. Stand up. Don't give up the fight, Texas. Thank you. Amen. Next up, we have Rabbi Josh Fixler, who is the president of the Faith Leaders Coalition of Greater Houston. If you're here from Houston and you don't know him, it seems like you should. In my tradition, in the Jewish tradition, the ancient rabbis asked an intriguing question. Why did God create all human beings from just one person? When you think about it, God could have simply created an earth full of people, but instead God made just one, just Adam. The Talmud teaches that God had to have it this way to show us something important about the nature of humanity. It says that Adam was created alone for the sake of peace among people, so that no one might say to their fellow, my father was greater than yours. The first chapters of Genesis remind us that we are all one human family. People of all genders, of all races, of all orientations and beliefs, we are all equal. And in a democracy, every person should have an equal voice. Let us be clear about the reason why we are here. This is about equality. As people of faith, we stand for equality. As people of faith, we will not stand idly by when our government seeks to silence the voices of some and privilege the voices of others. They are gathering in this building because they want to take away your voice. And do you know why they want to take away your voice? Do you know why they want to take away some of our voices? I'll let you in on a little secret. It's not because they think some voices are more deserving than others. Well, it's not only because they think that some voices are more deserving than others. The real reason they want to take away your voice is because they are scared. The people in this building are scared of the power of our voice. They have heard the power of our witness for justice. They have seen the power of our activism and our organizing, and they are scared. And they think that the only way that the structures that have kept them in positions of power can survive is if they try and take away our voices. When they try to make it harder for you to vote, it's about making it harder for you to exercise the power of your voice. That's it. It is that simple. Yes, we are here to talk about racism. Yes, we are here to talk about discrimination against people with disabilities, against the elderly, against women, against shift workers, against non-native English speakers, but mostly we are here to talk about whether or not we are going to have a voice. And we are here to show our leaders how we use our voice. We will lift up our voices to end racism. We will lift up our voices to end discrimination. We will lift up our voices for equality. We will lift up our voices to say, let my people vote. We will lift up our voices to say, let my people vote. In Judaism, we believe that there is nothing more powerful than a voice. It was with merely words that God created the entire universe. God said, let there be light, and there was light. God said, and there was. As the psalmist declares, God spoke the universe into being. And God's very first gift to that progenitor of all, Adam, was speech. In one early translation of Genesis 2, it says that God breathed into Adam's nostrils, and he became a speaking being. Adam's first act was to go around and name all the animals, another sign of the creative capacity of words. All of this is to remind us that our voices are our power. Our words are more powerful than any weapon, than any system, than any institution. There are people in this building who want to take away your voice because they want to take your power. But they can't take your voice. Can they take your voice? No. Can they take your power? No. no, because that voice and that power is a gift from God and no human being, no institution can take what God has given you. 
They want to pass SB1 to take our voice. Are we going to let them? Yeah. They want to pass HB3 to take our voice. Are we going to let them? Yeah. Let me hear you say our votes. Our voices, our power, our votes, our voices, our power. No one can silence our votes, our voice unless we let them. No one can take our power unless we let them. Are we going to let them? Are we going to let them? Let the let us lift every voice of faith in Texas. Let the halls of this Capitol building reverberate with our calls for justice. Let the streets of Austin rumble with our calls for equality. Let every hill and every river and every city and every field of this great state echo with the sounds of our call for voting rights for all because we are here to use our voice and use our power and say, let my people vote. Let me hear you say, let my people vote. Let my people vote. Let my people vote. Thank you. Thank you, Rabbi. Next, we have Linda Lewis, the NAACP's Voter Protection Chair. Good, good, good day to you freedom-fighting people on a day after the years death of John Lewis, thank you for getting in good trouble. Okay. I just want to talk to you and put some names and some faces to what these bills, these apartheid voter suppression bills are doing to Texas citizens. So let's start off by talking about Crystal Mason out of Dallas and Hervis Rogers out of Houston are in jail. They were, they uh, completed their sentences. They were on probation. They did not know that they didn't have the right to vote. So they are threatened with going back to prison for what? Voting. And are five times indicted under FBI investigation attorney general and his staff spent 22,000 billable, billable legal hours out of the 11 million Texans who voted in the 2020 election. And according to Senator, Mar uh, Senator Royce West, uh, they found point zero, 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 zero four cases of voter suppression. Point zero 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 four cases of voter suppression. Why? Because voting is powerful. And these forces, what is it that they want to do, you church people? Call and response. What do they not want to do? Let my people vote. Let my people vote. Let my people vote. Harris County, during a pandemic, during a life and death situation, they enacted some innovative voting things and created, created some 21st century voting solutions. 24-hour voting, drive-through voting, drop boxes, frontline workers. You know, they did this. And these people in this capital said, no, you don't, you can't do that. Let me tell you who that benefited. That benefited our frontline service workers. That benefited people who look like you and me. That benefited, you know, um, people who work in our schools who are there now trying to sanitize them for school to get started, the janitors and the cafeteria workers. That benefited them because in the 21st century in Texas, in this gig economy, people have two and three jobs just to get by. They can't go vote during the banker's hours of eight to five, they cannot. So these 21st century solutions have been pushed back by the folk in this capital because they do not want to do what? Let my people vote. 
let my people vote. And now this bill is criminalizing people who are just doing their civic duty, who are doing what is their obligation. Under this bill, um, a couple of things. The people who work in our elections are by and large retired people, retired school teachers, retired government workers. So under this bill, Big Mama is going to jail if she makes a mistake actually processing people to vote. And Joaquin and his Tia are going to jail if Joaquin is there to translate the language and to help his Tia learn how to use the machine. Under this bill, they're gonna go to jail. They're gonna be criminals because they are doing what? Voting, because these people don't want to let my people vote. Let my people vote. On a personal note, in Waco, Texas, in the 2020 election, my city council member, Andrea Jackson Bearfield, took me, her mother-in-law, and her neighbor to vote early the first day of voting. Uh, we had a Divine Nine thing going on. Any Divine Nine people out there? Under this bill, my council member would go to jail because she took three people not related to her to vote. So, the issue also is, is that this is a direct assault on people of a certain age, on people with disabilities, and certainly on black and brown people. Black people have been doing souls to the polls since the Voting Rights Act was signed in 1965. And so in most towns and cities across Texas, after church or before church or after mass, people get in the church van, go to the polling place and vote. So here's what's going to happen. The Catholics, the, the, the Catholics who come after 11 o'clock mass and meet us up at our polling place, the people who come in the church van and come to vote, that's now a criminal activity under this bill. That is a criminal activity under this bill. So our courageous state representatives, thank them. Use the tool in their toolkit to stop this craziness. One more thing. Under this bill, I, we just celebrated Juneteenth. So they tell me that in 1865, people who looked like me uh, were no longer slaves. But this bill brings back plantation overseer syndrome. Y'all know about plantation overseers? They were the folk watching the slaves to see what they do. But under this horrible apartheid voter suppression bill, poll watchers who are not trained, who are not accountable to anybody but the candidate or the party that they represent, they are free range poll watchers going all over the polling place and now they can complain and it's gonna cause voters to, go to also go to jail. In my county, at 2 p.m. in the afternoon, there were no voters there. One of the workers went in the kitchen to take her meds because she was of a certain age and she had meds, she had to take meds. The poll watcher got out of her seat, there are no voters there, went into the kitchen to see what the poll worker was doing. That's a plantation overseer if I've never ever seen one. Gal, what are you doing? Under this bill, we have to get rid of the poll watchers. We don't need them. It's an assumption that people who are voting are cheating. We don't need that. What we need is for them to let my people vote. I want to close since I've taken all of my time with some words from my, one of my prophets, Stevie Wonder. He said, 
we are tired of hearing your song, how you say you're going to change right from wrong. But if you really want to hear our views, you haven't done nothing. So let my people vote. Let my people vote. Let my people vote. Thank you, Texas Impact. Thank you, Linda. Nikki Boyd, who is a re an organizer with Rev Up Texas. Hi, I'm Nikki Boyd, and I'm with Rev Up Texas. Rev Up stands for register, educate, and vote and use your power. Well, we did that. We turned out record numbers in every minority. Disability. And so let me give you a little history on disability. And I, I promise I'm not going to fall off the stairs. We, well, first of all, this is the 31-year anniversary of the Americans with Disability Act. 31 years. But that didn't start with us asking. Well, it did. But we ended up climbing out of our wheelchairs to get Bush to sign the Americans Disability Act. We started the 504 program. If you don't know, they benefited from us. The disability community started that. You all, we all benefit from that. We have the right to go to school. But now they are taking away the right to vote. And then that will slowly be everything. But here's the thing about my people, and I'm sure you'll be proud about your people. My people never give up. My people are proud of who we are. Our governor is not proud of who he is. So he doesn't know what it's like. But that's OK, because we do. And we're going to be on that front line with all of y'all, because we know what it started. From back in biblical terms, we fought to drag our bodies. So don't use that word, handicap, please. That's, we don't like that word, just to educate. That means back in the day when we used to have to beg. I don't beg anymore. I have the right to vote. So we will vote, and my people only know how to fight. The only right we have is the right to an institutional setting. We fight just to live in the community. So with that, we have to fight to vote, because the only way you get stuff done is to vote, and then hold them accountable. Let our people vote. Let our people vote. Let our people vote. Minister Christian Watkins is here to bring us a final thought from the National Council of Churches. Grace, hope, and Holy Ghost power will be with you all on this day. My name is Minister Christian S. Watkins, and I bring you greetings on behalf of the National Council of Churches in Washington, D.C., proudly representing 38 Christian denominations. That is roughly 100,000 congregations and about 30 million people, across, people of faith across the United States. I rise today to say that the eyes of the nation are upon Texas, and the faith community, the faith advocacy community, stands with you all. Thank you, Texas Impact, for gathering us together in this space today, and it is a blessing to speak on the same dais as uh, uh, many of the esteemed leaders, such as you all, Bishop McKee, thank, bless you for being here, and bless you all for your tireless work. Since Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. marched in Selma, Alabama, and Washington, D.C. back in 1960s, the National Council of Churches has stood in solidarity and spoken prophetically about voting and civil rights, among other social justice issues, and we're definitely not stopping now. Voting rights are under attack in this nation once again, and our demands are simple. They are not radical or peculiar demands. We come today to demand that both the United States Congress and the Texas legislature let my people vote. The National Council of Churches echoes the clarion call of abolishing the Jim Crow filibuster and the passage of both the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act and the For the People Act, two strong pieces of legislation that will go a long way in reforming our democratic processes and safeguarding our sacred right to vote. I and I, for one, am grateful for the Texas Legislature Democrats for leaving the state, disrupting the flow of voter suppression and restrictive voting laws inspired by former President Donald Trump's lies. 
It was the prophet Jeremiah that proclaimed God's anguish in saying, they have, treated my, they have treated the wounds of my people carelessly, saying, peace, peace, when there is no peace. When really, when really has our nation truly been at peace? Our democracy being under attack is nothing new. In fact, our democracy as a system of government of the people, by the people, for the people, has been under attack since this nation was very established. The United States lofty, the United States lofty democratic ideals of unalienable rights and all persons being born equal was aborted before it was ever born. Speaking plainly, it was the founding old white male land-owning enslavers and their co-conspirators who compromised the establishment of true democracy when they intentionally included from we the people the, in the preamble of our nation's constitution, indigenous people, Latino people, and melanated men and women who built this nation from the, with their blood and bodies free of charge but, not, but at many costs. Before then and now, we has not included all. People has not included all of us. We, the wildest dreams of our sable skin ancestors, we, the perpetually excluded, and, the, and our multicultural cadre of righteous, indignant co-conspirators must continue to fight and demand that our very humanity be honored and our full rights be unencumbered. Thinking critically about race and its impacts on society would help us further understand these intersectional issues, but some folks don't want that kind of wisdom well known. Various influential members of the United States Congress have said that voting rights are fundamental to our democracy. Those words are meaningless unless they are backed up. Driven by fear of losing power through the dismantling of white supremacist rules and institutions, the filibuster has long been used by avowed racists who strategically willed its power to kill any progress to secure voting and civil rights for people of color in our nation. Driven by fear of losing power and prestige, both, Sen both Texas Senate Bill 1 and House Bill 3 severely curtail the hallmark of free and fair elections through voter suppression tactics from an old Jim Crow playbook. Driven by fear of losing power, they look to empower partisan poll watchers to create conflicts at the polls and limit who, when, and where citizens can carry out their sacred right to vote. I rise to tell you to say that enough is enough. That fear is crippling our country. That fear of racial equity is impeding progress. That fear of doing what is right instead of what is financially and politically advantageous is perpetuating injustice by those we, the people, elect to power. But my Bible tells me that God did not give us a spirit of fear, but God gave us a spirit of love, hope, power, and of a sound mind. I feel my help coming through here. We must use that sound mind, that good sense God gave us, and the power of all our unified voices to collectively advocate to move power for the benefit of all God's creation, for all God's people, for the edification of this country that we love. Beloved, we're standing in a long legacy of ecumenical, civic, and social leaders standing in the gap for the least, last, and lost among us. The struggle continues indeed, and we're going to keep fighting and doing it together, am I right about it? Yeah. We gotta keep up the good trouble, calling on the better angels of the adversaries until justice is won. Justice isn't a once and, is not a once and done type fight. It's gotta be fought over and over and over again. Where there's, an, while there's nothing new under the sun, our time under God is now. Everybody say I'm all in. Let me say it. Let me hear it one more time. Say, I'm all in. I'm all in. If you love our country's foundational principles and all, and all people are created equal and have unalienable rights, including life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, then keep up the good trouble and advocating for what is right in our country. Let me hear you say, I'm all in again. If you love the, this country's rich diversity and the contributions communities of colors have continuously made despite being disenfranchised then keep standing up and speaking out on those things that are set to divide us and destroy us. Let me hear you say it one last time, I'm all in. I'm all in. Beloved, if you love doing what is good, standing for what is right and racially equitable and seeing progress for we the people, say, let my people vote. Let my people vote. Let my people vote. Let my people vote. 
My name is Minister Christian S. Watkins of the National Council of Churches, and we will not be satisfied until justice rolls down like water and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. And now we've got Reverend George Mason from Wilshire Baptist Church in Dallas, Texas, who is going to send us forth. I'm the last one. Go ahead. You can clap now. Does anybody join me in regretting and mourning the erosion of democratic norms that has led our democratic lawmakers to leave the state of Texas? This has not happened in a vacuum. This is like the law of physics applied to politics that every action has an equal and opposite reaction. And what has happened here is not that these lawmakers have left the state to deprive the House of a quorum because they were afraid they weren't going to get their way or have their say. On the contrary, they knew something bigger was afoot. That is the fundamental nature of democracy itself. That these bills, SB1 and HB3, would deprive many Texans of their right to have their say. As faith leaders, I can tell you that we would all much rather be here to argue for, to advocate about things like health care expansion and the full funding of public schools and gun safety, and we could go on and on, but we find ourselves astonished that we have to be here to address a fundamental principle of our democracy, our very system of government itself. Universal access to voting for every eligible Texan should not be up for debate. Any provisions that put a damper on that principle strike at the very heart of our democracy. We need to take a step back. We need a different spirit. Our public theologian, Brian McLaren, has said this. More than ever before in our history, we need a new kind of personal and social fuel. Not fear, but love. Not prejudice, but openness. Not supremacy, but service. Not inferiority, but equality. Not resentment, but reconciliation. Not isolation, but connection. Not a spirit of hostility, but the Holy Spirit of hospitality. It may be that those who have promoted these bills say that they feel the same way in their hearts. That's wonderful. We're not interested in what they feel. We want to see this become standard operating procedure in the State House. SB1 and HB3 in their current form take us back to a place we thought we had left for good. And we're here to remind you of what Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. said in his letter from the Birmingham jail, a historical document in our nation's history that if some people in this building had their way, will no longer be taught to Texas school children. Dr. King made the distinction between just and unjust laws. Unjust laws do not square with the moral law. Any law that degrades human personality is unjust, he said. And then this, a law is unjust in that if it is inflicted on a minority, that as a result of being denied the right to vote, had no part in enacting or devising the law. He speaketh still. This is what we are here for. This is what we will always be here for. We can do no other. Amen. Thank you so much for coming, friends. 
For those of you who registered and had ordered lunch, we've got lunch set up for you over there. For those of you who had planned to make legislative visits, uh, the capital awaits you. Uh, you have your plans made, hopefully, by now. And um, for all of you, we are so pleased to be in partnership with you. Thank you so much. You make the community of Texas better.